Matthew 24. Glad you're in church. Amen. Glad you're in church. Listen, God's still on the throne, still saving souls. Still saving souls. Um, I told the folks in the Sunday school hour that Eric Fair called me this morning. Well, he sent me a WhatsApp. And um, he's preaching at a Bible conference for youth. And he said seven girls and three boys got saved over there at the conference. And that was, listen, God is still doing what he's always done. He's changing lives. We cannot be complacent. Now is a great time for us to try to reach folks. Um, it's good. It's good that he's rattled us up a little bit. What I've noticed is the people I work with are more tender toward the gospel. People we run into door knocking and, and whatnot have seem to be a lot more tender. Brethren, don't get complacent. Right now is not the time to get complacent. There's so many people that are stepping out in eternity right now, and, and there's so much fear right now. Um, we need to offer them some hope. And listen, God's word offers hope. Just like it changed your life, brought peace to you. Let's be busy. You know, take the time. Take the time to witness to that co-worker that God has put in your heart and your mind to witness to. Take the time for that family member that you pleaded with 10 or 12 times already. And just go ahead on and do it one more time. Just do it one more time. Plead with them one more time. Listen, it can't hurt us. It can't hurt them. I think the time is winding down. And that's why we're in Matthew 24. I want to show you. Uh, I think one of the biggest marks of this generation is, is really discussed in Matthew 24 multiple times. And um, we need to recognize this and understand it's the generation we're living in. Matthew 24. Let's just read down, what they read down to say verse 35 and uh, get a kind of an understanding of what's going on here. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show uh, him the building of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Now keep in mind, as you read Matthew 24, they ask him three questions. Do you see that? Three questions. He answers all three of them. And so you got to be careful as you're reading, what is he answering? Okay? So notice the questions. Tell us, when shall these things be? First question. What shall be the signs of thy coming? Second question. And the end of the world. So he, they're asking him three different things here. But notice he's going to cover all of those in context here. Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Do you see that first word there? Deceive you, first time it's mentioned here. This is what you're going to find as we read down. I want to emphasize this word. This word is mentioned in this passage relative to the last days multiple times in Matthew 24. And listen, we are in a generation where the deception is extremely high. Let me tell you what, you'll get on YouTube, you'll get on social media, and you're going to see the latest scare. You're going to see the latest deception. You're going to see the latest con. You're going to see the latest um, whatever it is to strike fear in the hearts of men. You're going to see it. Let me tell you something. We are living in a generation where you can't trust the news media. You can't trust the people you work with. Many don't trust the government. You hear me? That's right. Listen, we're living in a generation where the deception is so incredibly high that people are scared half to death. You don't know what to believe. There's so much misinformation. 
I get these things all the time uh, about uh, these false flags and all this. And listen, I'm not into all that. I'll, be t I'll tell you the truth about it. I'm not into all that. Because I need to keep my head in this book. This book right here is the only thing that is true and doesn't change and is consistent. And we're living in a generation that is so deceived by so many things that, listen, if you don't plant your feet on something that's solid, you're going to get caught up and you're going to miss what God intended for you to be a part of during this generation. Listen, don't focus on the latest deception that's out there. You keep, I'm going to show you, when we get to the last verse that I'm going to read, I'm going to show you the key, even though the deception is high, and that's what we're going to preach on this morning, the deceptions that are here. And we see the first deception, let no man deceive you. That's the first one. Let's read down. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, See that you be not uh, troubled. Do you see what he says? Hello, church. He says, see that you be not troubled. There's some Christians in our churches that are troubled by things that God said, don't be troubled by them. They're going to come to pass. You're not going to change it. It's got to come. And we see it. We see the wars and the rumors of war. He said, see that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famine and pestilence and earthquake in diverse places. Hello! There shall be COVID in diverse places. There's earthquakes and, and all kinds of wars and rumors of wars. But you know what he said to you? See that you be not troubled. Verse number nine. Then shall they deliver up you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Now naturally, he's talking to a nation here. He's speaking directly to his disciples. Context here is going to be specifically Israel. But there's it's not without an application to us. We got to be careful. Because we're going to see these things come to pass just like them. He gave us his word so that we're not deceived, y'all. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. You see the word again. He says deceive many. Many Joel Osteens will arise and deceive many with a covetous, wicked doctrine. Of, 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 uh, he, he draws them with covetousness. We're going to see it later. Listen, you be careful. This generation is full of, of deception. God is a balanced a fair, righteous God. He's not just a God of love and he does not ignore your sin. You will have to have your sins forgiven. He is in the business of forgiving them. But if you think he's in the business of ignoring them, you've got a false doctrine promoted by a false prophet. Right. Right. Listen, you see it coming. Because iniquity shall abound. Can you see the iniquity abounding? Look at this. The love of many shall wax cold. Hello. That's our churches right there. He describes to a T. Where is the love in the churches? Where is the weeping for sinners? Where is the crying for family? Where is that, that troublesome spirit where we are burdened because we love them so much we don't want them to die and go to hell? Where is that at in our churches? Listen. The love of many has what's cold. Don't get cold, y'all. This generation wants to pour a cold bucket of water on your religion. We need to have a fiery hot religion that's stirred up for God. And we still can. He warns 
wisdom that the love of many shall wax cold. Verse 13. That he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Now, this is not a formula. Saved, that word saved means multiple things in your Bible. And saved, if you read it, does not always mean salvation from sin. So you be careful when you read the word, because the old witnesses say, see, you got to endure to the end to be saved. Well, if you cross-reference that a little bit later, uh, verse number 22, if that's the case, except those days should be short, and shall no flesh be saved. Is that talking about the salvation of souls or still alive? It's talking about still alive. Saved alive, according to Joshua 6.25, if you run the cross reference. Saved does not always mean salvation from sin. You've got to be careful. Look here. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Then shall the end come. Then shall, uh, uh, when ye shall... Uh, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place whosoever readeth uh, let him understand uh, then let them that be in Judea flee into the mountains and let him which is uh, on the housetop come not down to take anything out of the, his house neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes Woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. That's how you know. See how it's applying to Israel. See how the context is Jewish. We can make an application to ourselves, and that's what I'm doing. But the application there is to Israel. And you can see the mention of it there with the Sabbath. Look here. Um, Verse number 21, for then shall, the, uh, then shall be great tribulation, such as not since the beginning of the world uh, to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man say unto you, lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not, for there shall arise uh, false Christ and, and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible they shall deceive the very elect. You see how it's over? There's a, there's a theme over and over that you don't need to be deceived. And you know what he says? He goes so far to say there's going to be false prophets that are actually going to perform miracles. There's going to be many hands that are going to uh, seem to heal people and, 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 but these, are, these appear to be real. These appear to be real works of the devil. Listen, just because somebody can do something, a, a sign or a wonder, does not mean it's of God. That Listen, we see that the Antichrist is going to deceive the whole world by that method. By signs and wonders. Lying signs and wonders. We need to be careful. Listen, we are not to trust in feelings and emotions. We are to trust in the facts of the word of God. Listen, because there's so many people that are going to try to stir you up through emotion. I, and you can't help but have emotions if you love God. Right. Those emotions can't help but to come out. Amen. I hear preaching, you'll see them over and over. The, the, the floodgates open. And I get excited. I'm not, listen, I, I'm going to say amen and hallelujah. And I don't care if anybody else does. If the Lord moves my heart, it's what I'm going to do. If I feel like i got to raise my hand, let the Lord know I love him. That's what I'm going to do. But I cannot let those emotions dictate what is true. Okay? So just because a man can do something to stir you and wow you, you better be careful. Because the Bible says that that, that is going to be a method in the last days. And it's always been that way, y'all. The devil has always had some element of power that he tries to mimic God. We see that with the plagues in, in Egypt. Look what it says here. Verse number 25. Behold, I have told you. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even to the west, so shall, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there shall the eagles be gathered together. 
I need to talk about that one day. Remind me, verse 28, I'd like to, to, to mention that. I don't have time here this morning. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven be shaken and there shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Uh, then shall the, all the tribes of the earth mourn. They shall see the Son of Man coming in clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now learn the parable of the fig tree, when the branch is yet tender and put forth uh, leaves, ye know that the summer is nigh. So likewise, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the door. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass, Speaking of the generation when this happened. He's not saying this generation that y'all are living in. Because a lot of people say that's a contradiction in your Bible. Right? They say that generation passed. So the Bible is not true. He's saying when you see the signs of these things coming. The current generation when those signs are taking place. Is when the end is. He's not saying to those disciples that your generation is not going to pass. He's saying the generation where those signs are revealed, that's when it's not going to pass. And people will point to that as a, a, a contradiction. So I want you to know that. I want to point that out. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Look what it says in verse 35. Here's the key. Here's the answer. Here's the solid rock that we need to stand on. David said he brought me up out of a horrible pit. A set my feet up on a rock and establish my going. This is the key. Heaven and earth shall pass away. Listen. All the viruses are going to pass away. All the rulers are going to pass away. All the rioting is going to pass away. All the trouble is going to pass away. All of that will be there and it's going to pass away. There's one thing that is sure and we need to make sure we're in that thing and we know what it says. But my words shall not pass away. Listen, our confidence is not in rulers. Our confidence is not in ourselves. Our confidence is, is, confidence is not in our ability. Our confidence is is in the word of God to perform exactly what it said it would do. Listen, you begin to put confidence in. The Bible says it's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Right. Does that include your preacher? Right. Does that include your favorite faithful Christian? Right. Men will let you down. Right. Women will let you down. Right. God will not let you down. Down. He Amen. said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. Listen, we are living. You see the word all listen. Verse number, verse number um, verse number four, you see the seed. Verse number eleven, you see the seed. Verse number twenty-four, you see the seed. You see the theme over and over. He's warning us not to be deceived. And so I want to talk about some of those deceptions. Let no man deceive you. Is what he says. Take heed that no man deceive you in verse 4. Look at um, 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. 2 Thessalonians 2 this morning. Let's look over here. Speaking of the Antichrist. In 2 Thessalonians 2. The scripture says this. Second Thessalonians 2 verse 1. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon, what? Shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter from us as the day of Christ is at hand. Look what he says. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. He warns you not to let a man deceive you. 
You got the word of God, so there's no reason to be deceived. Get in that thing and read it. You need to know what it says. So the Holy Spirit can draw from that bank that you've installed in there when the time comes and your fear comes and your trouble comes. You need some, some cashing out to help you. But if you don't have anything in the bank, you're going to be in trouble. You need that word of God. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You need to put it in there. Romans 16. Romans 16. Men will deceive you. You've got to be careful. Romans 16. Look at verse number 17. Now I beseech you, brethren. Romans 16, verse 17. Romans 16, 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have heard, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own bellies. By good words and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple. You say, you say, where's that at? That's your Joe Osteen right there. His God is what? His belly. Listen, they serve their own selves. That guy is rich, incredibly rich. If that guy was a Christian, if, uh, listen, listen, if that guy is a Christian, then we had a saying when I would grow up, and this may not be appropriate, then I'm a Chinese navigator. Listen, that guy with all those riches, you have a true Christian with that kind of riches, they're going to reach the community with the gospel, and they're going to choose not to take that station. Your Savior himself gave up great riches to come and minister to the poor. That's right. That is not a Christian. I ain't afraid to say it at all. That guy is a false prophet, and he's a liar, and he's a deceiver, and he's deceived many, and that prosperity gospel he preaches that God will bless you physically is a lie. And you shouldn't be deceived by that garbage. But it says good words. Fair speeches. I ain't ever seen a guy, but he's got it plastered. I'm not saying smiling ain't good. What I'm saying is everything he says is good words and fair speeches. It's smooth. And when he's confronted about questions like this that the Bible is clear about, do you think a homosexual can go to heaven? Do you think that a... I believe they can be saved. There ain't nobody going to heaven if they trust Christ as their Savior. Right. Do you think that, that Muslims and all Catholics are going to hell? Hey, y'all, what's the answer to that? If they believe the doctrines of the churches that they're a part of, yes, that's the answer. Joel Osteen won't answer it, but Brother Mike here with his... Massive crowd of thousands will answer it. That's right. Amen. Listen, it's smooth and it's fair, but it ain't right. And listen, there are multitudes of other people just like him right. that you'll find on whatever channel you want to go to. And you need to be careful. You need to be careful who you follow. First uh, John chapter 3. I get people all the time say, man, I can't believe you name names. Well, I don't know. Uh, Paul the Apostle said, among whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. He said, Alexander the coppersmith has, has, you know, he's done me evil. I, 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 I'm not saying, I'm not saying that there's, we have to do it all the time. What I'm saying, I need to expose to you the people in our society. There's no point in me talking about people 100 years ago. When there's some right here that I need to expose that are going to cause you problems if you follow their ways. That's right. 
First John chapter number three. First John three. Verse number seven, little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. Notice, let no man deceive you. Let no man deceive you about this one thing. You know what he said? He that committeth sin is of the devil. You know what he's saying here? It's not good to sin. He said, don't you let nobody deceive you that God is going to ignore that. That's what he's trying to drive at. And we live in a society who's turned the grace of God into lasciviousness. You know how you see it? You see it with the rainbow. Rainbow was a promise of God that he wouldn't destroy the earth like he did. And you know what they've done? They've taken that and made it a symbol of perversion. That's turning the grace of God because he promised them grace through that rainbow that he wouldn't do it like that again. That's turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. The next thing is a general deception. Galatians chapter number 6. Just a, a, a deception where there's various things said in the scriptures that you shouldn't be deceived about, Galatians 6. Uh, one of them is sowing and reaping here in Galatians 6. Galatians 6 says in verse 7, Galatians 6, verse 7, he says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Now I'm glad there's both sides. Listen, there's a law that he said don't be deceived about. He said this, if you sow to your flesh, you're going to of the flesh reap corruption. But if you sow to the Spirit, you'll of the Spirit reap life everlasting. There's two sides to that. Let me ask you something. He told you not to be deceived. It's a law of sowing and reaping. If you sow to this flesh, a lot of Christians are sowing to this flesh. I've lived long enough in this to know and see the example of my own life. I don't need anybody else to illustrate it. I have reaped things in my life that I regretted reaping because I sowed to the flesh prior to. And I'm ashamed. I don't need to point at nobody else. I can point at me. And if you're honest, you can point at you. You have some regrets in your Christian life because you sowed to a direction you shouldn't have. And when you saw the end of it, you were down there asking God for a crop favor. Oh, God, I messed up. Oh, God, I did wrong. I can't believe I, I messed up back there. I shouldn't have made that decision. And you know what? You didn't deal with it when the Holy Spirit told you you need to get that thing right. And you know what? You suffered loss for it. But thank God, there are some things that I did right that now I see the fruit of that right and the right decisions that I made. You're going to reap what you sow. If you're sowing seeds to the flesh, do not be surprised that flesh comes from you. And there's a lot of Christians praying for a crop better when they could have just planted right to begin with. I, I'm, I listen, there's dozens of illustrations I can illustrate with my own life that I regret. I was foolish. I've lost sleep over them because they caused such flaws that hinder me in my life. You're going to reap what you sow. You cannot put a watermelon seed in the ground and get corn. You can take a bag of seeds and put 10 seeds in there and jumble them up and broadcast them, cast them, and disc them over. 
But every one of those seeds will bring forth what you planted. It will not bring forth anything but what you planted. So we have to be careful in our lives, what we allow in our lives and how we live. Because there's a law of reaping and sowing. And God says, I don't want you to be deceived about that. There's a lot of Christians deceived about that. They think they can live any way they want to and God's going to bless it. And he won't. He won't. He's merciful. And he's kind. And he's tender. And he's patient. And if it wasn't for that, we'd all be in trouble. Sorry, that's right. Look at Romans 7. Romans 7. Romans 7. Romans, 7. Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Look what it says. Paul's given his famous uh, passage where he, he's wrestling back and forth, showing that he has sin and problems with sin. He said, the things that I would do, that's what I do. And the things that I want to do right, I don't do them. And we see that wrestling with Paul. Uh, that's amazing to me. It's amazing to me that a Christian who wrote 13 books of your Bible wrestled with the same thing God wrestled with. But I appreciate his transparency in Romans 7. If Romans 7 wasn't in the Bible, I would probably be in despair about a lot of things. It helps me realize that I, I got a problem just like every other saint in the past had a problem. Look what he says here in verse number 11. For sin, taken occasion by the commandment, deceived me by it, slew me. Let me say something to you. Boys, I want you to look up here at me for a second. Sin is not what it appears sometimes. Let me tell you something. I committed sins that I enjoyed while I was committing them. Sin isn't always you commit it and you die right away and it's dark and dreary and listen, Sin has a lure. The Bible speaks of the pleasures of sin for a season. It's pleasant to the body. Your body likes that thing. That flesh enjoys it. But let me tell you something. You better consider the end. It's like Bucky preached about Samson. You better consider the end of your sin. You're going to be in a trap when it's done. And it will no longer be the pleasures of sin anymore. It's deceptive. And the Bible says, Paul says that it deceived him. The greatest Christian, I believe, in the scriptures, it deceived him. And listen, there's nobody here, there's nobody here that has suffered what Paul the Apostle has suffered in his lifetime for the gospel's sake. And he said, sin to see. And that's the way it'll do you. And you need to be careful in your life. I, listen, don't pet it. Don't keep it. Don't keep it and, and just pet it. You get rid of it. That thing will bite you one day. Oh, it's a little puppy right now. But it'll grow up and it'll bite the hand that feeds it. I guarantee you that guarantee you that. All right. Our association we need to be not deceived about. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Great chapter on the resurrection, but right smack in the middle of this chapter, he gives us a warning. Verse 32. He says, If after the manner of men I have fought with the beast of Ephesus, what advantage it me if the dead rise not, let us uh, eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Look what he says. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Let me tell you something. Many a teenager has thought this thought, I just need to go and 
reach them and pull them up where I'm at. I need to just go where they're at, pull them up where I'm at. Listen, the only person that's capable of pulling them up is God. You try to reach them, but you better be careful where you reach them at. The Bible says that their evil communications will corrupt your good manners. You're not listening. The chances of them bringing you where they're at is greater than the chances of you bringing them up where you're at. Right. You better be careful. I'm not saying don't try to reach the loss. I'm not saying that at all. But many have used that excuse that I was just trying to help them and I got caught up. That's right. You better be careful. There's some places you don't need to go. There's some things you don't need to be associated with because it will corrupt you. And the Bible says, don't be deceived about it. 1 Corinthians 6, while we're there. 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians 6. Passage I got saved and under conviction about is found right here in 1 Corinthians 6. It's another deception. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. Know ye not, the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived. Do you see that? Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Our society has a thought that everybody who dies goes to heaven except for the really, 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 really bad people. And that's a lie. Because why is it a lie? Because everybody alive is a really, 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 really bad person. You say, well, I'm not that bad. I know some people aren't that bad. Listen, if you allow your self-righteousness to keep you out of heaven, you're bad. And God dies. But listen, he didn't want you to be deceived. Sin is what actually takes us and condemns us, keeps us out of heaven. People say, well, you know, uh, there's this whole uh, doctrine that's being promoted now that you just believe and don't turn away. I'm not saying repentance alone. Repentance doesn't save you. Re repentance is the porch you have to stand on to open the door of salvation. You're going to have to turn from some things. But turning doesn't save you. I agree with that part. But listen, you've got to get to that point or you don't see your need. He doesn't expect you to live the same way you were when you get saved. We see this in a lot of people. Listen, he says the unrighteous are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. He expects you to turn from that wickedness and trust him. The last deception, which is, it leaves me very fearful. This is one, uh, 1 John chapter number 8, 1 John 8. The last deception that is very scary to me because I examine myself a lot uh, over this issue right here. First Corinthians chapter number uh, one, I mean, I'm sorry, First John chapter number one, sorry, get it worked out here. First John chapter number one, not, not the matter of not having sin that bothers me because I know I'm a sinner, but this self-deception is probably the worst deception you'll ever suffer. That's why we have the Word of God. The Word of God not only protects you from men, not only protects you from the sins, but it protects you from yourself. Because all we like sheep have gone astray every man to his own way. We're prone to wonder. The hymn writer wrote it. Prone to wonder. Lord, I feel it. Prone to lead the God I love. We're all like that. We're prone to, to our own way and our own thing. Look what it says here in verse 7. But if you walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth 
is not in us. Listen, probably one of the worst deceptions in the world is deceiving yourself. It's hard to get somebody out of a deception that's a self-deception. When they think they're right and they got it all figured out and you can see it's plain they don't and they're wrong, listen, when a person has deceived themselves, it's extremely hard to convince them of their error. Listen, I, I say this because I've had people try to reason with me about things I had wrong. But listen, when the, you put the blinders on yourself because you're not willing to listen to the Word of God, you're going to get in trouble. When that Word of God says we're all sinners and we've all come short of His glory, it's by His standard. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3. Look at verse number 16. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16. He says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Let no man deceive who? Himself. If any man among you seem to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he might be wise. Listen. Listen to what it's saying. You're less prone to self-deception when you're humble about who you are. When you got pride in your life about how good you are and what you've done, you're going to get in trouble every single time. Self-deception often comes when people think that they're better than other people. You better be careful not to deceive yourself. Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah 17. We'll take this verse and we'll go back to Matthew 24 and be done. Lord willing. Jeremiah 17, look at verse number 9. It says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You know who knows it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his way and according to the fruit of his doing. But from your perspective, the Bible says your heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. You are prone to stray. You're not prone to righteousness uh, unless you stay in that book and God begins to work and heal you and help you. Listen, you've got to go back to Matthew 24. I want to emphasize this, and we're just going to close right here. Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Look at verse number 35. I'm going to emphasize this one more time. Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Brethren, in a generation that is so steep with deception, listen to me, beloved. Reach over and hit the off button. Click Right there it is. He's filming with it. Never mind. But reach over and turn the off button off on that thing and get in that book and let God keep you from the deceptionists in this generation. Amen. Listen, y'all. The same newscast that you're going to watch two hours from now will be playing six hours from now. You don't need to get caught up with that junk. 
you need to turn some of that off and open the pages of that book and let God help you because we're living in generations that a generation that is just slam full of deceivers. And you don't want to even deceive yourself. So you need to stay in that book to keep yourself right. Listen, it's not enough, y'all. You are not going to get fed enough coming to church a few days a week. That's not enough. It is not, I promise you, it's not enough. Listen, do you think 40 minutes here, 50 minutes here, three times on Sunday, it ain't even that. Let's just say two hours on Sunday, hour and a half, hour on Wednesday. Do you think that's going to keep you out of trouble when you're bombarded all day, every day? It's not enough. I can't, I can't feed you enough. You're going to have to feed yourself. You need to get in there and read what it says and get some strength for yourself. Listen, we're living in deceiving times. Deception is high, but God's word doesn't change. And listen, it's a strength. If we just stay in it, stay in it. God will give us strength. We'll overcome even this generation. Generations before have been through stuff like we're going through. What do you do with people during the Great Depression? plagues they had, they made it through it. Listen, let's just trust God, keep our eyes on Him so we're not deceived. Amen? Amen. Alright, let's stand for prayer. Brother Marshall, will you dismiss us?